This edition of Where Did the Road Go is sponsored by Tim, Allison Cook, Eric Hervin, and Super Inframan. If you want to learn how you can sponsor the show, go to wheredidtheroadgo.com. And now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And tonight, we continue in our ongoing series of UFO history with Mr. Mike Cleland. I'm Hello, here, Mike. thank you. <laughs> and, and Aaron Gullius. Hi, hi, how's it going? So, the, uh, the people from Michigan. The- yes. <laughs> That's, yeah, yeah. Except now you're in New York, fairly close to me, Mike. I am, yeah. I just can't get you down here. I have been stuck, stuck, stuck here trying to finish up a bunch of projects, so... Right. There will be a day. <laughs> well, so 2019, I don't feel, I, I had said this when we first put this together, I don't feel like a ton of stuff happened in 2019 UFO-wise. I reached out to my Patreons. They came up with a bunch of stuff. Um, do you want to start, uh, Aaron, with the thing you just mentioned? Before yeah. We- um, I think my, my favorite thing that happened this year has uh, nothing to do with the Navy uh, and, <laughs> and nothing to do with uh, with any large organizations um it's uh it's the fact that you know 40 some years after the uh the pascagoula abductions down in um down in alabama um we've got some new witnesses that came forward in uh in 2019 calvin parker came out with uh, with his own book um his, his book about his experiences um which he had never really been very forthcoming at all talking about uh, about that um Charles Hickson was the one who sort of was the the voice of the Pascagoula thing back in the day. And so Hickson comes out with his book this year and um it was it made the local news down in uh, down in Pascagoula and, and those areas and there are uh, a number of people who have come forward saying that that they saw something. Um the the same night uh one guy was a, a guy named Joey Nelson and I if I remember the story right he was uh he was you know, driving down um, some highway at, with some friends, and they were they were planning on on going to uh, some bars and, and and making some money playing pool. That that sort of stuck with me that that was what they were, were they were doing, and um, they were going to uh, I think they were going to uh, Louisiana, probably New Orleans actually, and uh, they were um, they were. They were driving, and they saw uh, they saw a a UFO, and it was the same night and in the same general area as the uh, the Pascagoula sighting. Um, there were other people, sort sort of around uh, that region, who saw different UFOs that night, and um, it would have been sort of amazing if if all of those witnesses would have come forward back in 1973 all at the same time, um, but. Uh, as it is, the uh, the Pascagoula abduction was was, you know, just you know striking on its own. But now, forty odd years later, people people coming out of the woodwork saying, "Well, you know, now that you mention it, I did see something that night. I think that was the night I saw I saw the thing." So, so for anyone who doesn't know what the that encounter was, why don't you want to explain it to people? Yeah, Pascagoula was. Um, it was one of those sort of. I don't want to say proto abductions but it was one of the early ones it was one of the when the word abduction starts getting used it's one of the examples along with betty and barney hill and antonio Villas-Boas, that that gets sort of sort of lumped into that abduction category rather than a sort of old school contact experience and you had two guys who were um working uh working on the river um charles hickson and uh and uh Calvin Parker, and they um, they were they were fishing, I think, and a craft landed, and uh, a door opened up, and weird creatures emerged. They sort of look. Um, I'm uh, I'm looking back at my poster of Greg Bishop's book. It defies language because it's got a Pascagoula alien drawing on the cover of it, yes, and drawn it, drawn by Redfield Junkie, Redfield yeah. Junkie, um, who did a great. Um, 
um, audio introduction for your your new book, Mike. Oh, you heard it. You heard it. Yeah, I, let's I, plug I, that. You just you yeah. plug that as much as you want. It, it so. was it was uh, <laughs> he did he did a he did a great job with it. I love his voice. Um, so he um, they the, the, the monster um, the monster. If you can sort of imagine, kind of the uh, sort of Michelin Man look. Um, with a head that doesn't have any features on the face, just these sort of three spikes sticking out where ears and a nose would be, and these giant sort of claw-like hands at the end of these long sort of tube-like arms. It's it's not like anything really that had ever been described before or, or really uh, really since. And so they they go on board the craft and later um, under hypnosis, a lot of details come out about their experiences on the craft and it's it's very much that that sort of clinical medical examination type of uh, type of setup. And um, uh, um, Hickson, Charles Hickson and I can't remember who co-wrote the book with him, but the, the, there's a book that came out back in, um, I think the the 70s might have been early 80s, and uh, it's been republished recently. Um, but the original is is incredibly difficult to get a hold of and and very expensive. So it's it's good that it was re uh, reissued. But a really interesting um, really interesting abduction story at a time when abductions were were very much the new thing, and now. You know, after after decades, you've got other people sort of corroborating at least, you know, sort of the UFO sighting aspect of this. Well, why did it take them so long? I wonder. You know, that's that's a good question. Uh, the news stories in the uh, the local papers there in uh, in Mississippi just sort of just sort of talk about how well you know it, it sort of jogged jogged their memories. Um, it might be. I mean, the stories I read, it doesn't have a lot of um, a lot of uh, explanation about why they didn't say anything up till now. They talk about why they didn't say anything at the time. They they didn't want to look like idiots. Uh, is, is sort of the, the general impression. But um, I wonder if uh, if they sort of say, well, I'm not going to say anything, and then they put it out of their mind, and then you know, with social media pasting these stories all over their local news feeds, you know, living in the area, you know, it's like, well, you know what, maybe, maybe, you know, it's not as weird to mention my flying saucer sighting in 2019 as it was in 1973, or I'm old enough that I just don't care what people think of me anymore. Um, that, uh, that, that's sort of, you know, the, the explanations I saw, it's, it's, it's very much that sort of, well, I figured it was time to say something since everybody's talking about it again. And it's, um, it's being taken maybe a little more, a little more seriously than it was, uh, back then. Okay. I, I agree. I think times have changed and people can come forward and talk about this stuff in a way that they, they simply could not have getting very close to 50 years ago now. Yeah. But how, yeah. how accurate are their memories going to be at this point? That's yeah. a good question. I bet you that the, you know, the grand sweeping narrative is close. The minutia and the details probably are a little jumbled up. But yeah, I mean... I mean, people couldn't remember things from 50 years ago easy. You mm -hmm. know, it's obviously flawed, and you have to take take it with a grain of salt. And but, but um, I mean, it's hard. It's not like they're, you know, they might. <clears throat> the the bigger issue, I guess, would be misremembering the date. Yeah, know. I was just gonna say, um, I I can't remember the exact date of things that happened last year. Um, <laughs> m much less, uh, much less, you know, 50 years ago. Yeah. 50 years ago yeah so um I, I think i think that would be uh that would be an issue um but that i mean th there's there's a, a whole raft of built-in credibility and sort of questioning issues whenever anybody has a sighting even if it was relatively recently um just because there's all sorts of things you can question about you know the way we perceive things especially distance and size and speed and things mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. so um i i think it's an issue um remembering the exact date but uh it's no more insurmountable an issue than any of the other issues you could raise <laughs> about uh about a sighting so i i think um i think the the significant thing is is that you know that that notion like you said mike that that people feel more comfortable bringing it up that times have changed in uh in in the last few years especially 1973 i mean we're in that we're in that sort of grim 
post Condon report era where where the 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 general mass media had written off UFOs as as being unworthy of of scientific study like the Condon committee said and so really the only people doing UFOs were UFO types and uh and and the the ridicule factor there in the the early 70s was i think um higher than it would have been in 1963 for example um and i, I certainly higher than it is uh than it is now okay. yeah oh yeah yeah and that leonard nimoy saved us all uh, <laughs> he did the few he years did. later yeah so <laughs> i love i love i love that show i i, I love I, oh. uh, it's the fact that you can just click on that on youtube is just you know like i know what i if i have a half hour to kill i know where i'm going so. yeah. and, I, I, and I, that I, would be in search of in search the, of yes, I, the show in I search actually of. um i actually i think it was gosh probably two days ago i don't know how we got talking about it but i i sort of rambled on to my students for like five minutes about how all this all this stuff on uh, this ancient alien stuff on the history channel you you guys don't know what cool is cool is you know reruns of in search of when you're five years old and the weird synthesizer music is freaking you out that's (laughs) that's the true ancient astronaut experience it's not (laughs) this nonsense now and leonard nimoy's job you know wardrobe yeah, boy, that'll that's, that will never resurface. Yeah, man. <laughs> lapel so big you could hang glide, man. Yeah, it, it, it's just gorgeous. Did and either a beautiful of, voice? Did yeah. either of you watch the newer version of of In Search of? I've I've seen a few episodes of it. Yeah, it's um, it's, it's uh, with the Spock guy, the Zachary yeah, uh, new Quinto. Spock guy. Yeah. yeah which I, I think is a, a neat uh, a neat touch it's mm-hmm. it's it's okay um i i think as as far as shows like that go it's it's uh it's perfectly acceptable television um it just doesn't have the it's lapels. sort of under it doesn't have the lapels and i think it's sort of undermined <laughs> by content wise we're not really doing much different than everything else the history channel is doing on friday nights yeah. as as far as that that angle on uh, on paranormal stuff and, and history stuff. So I think that's really the the biggest strike against it is it doesn't it doesn't stand out enough, maybe, uh, from just sort of content wise from from that other other material. And, I, and I've seen advertisements of uh, <clears throat> is it called unexplained with uh, with um, uh huh Captain Kirk, Chatner. Oh, cool. I haven't, I, mean, I, haven't, was- I haven't seen that yet, but I saw the advertisement for it. Oh, you know, there's a show from the 70s. It was like, a, I think it was, I'm not sure if it's feature length television, but th- William Shatner hosted a uh, UFO documentary. It must have been in the mid 70s. Um, well, once again, big, big, uh, beautiful lapels. And he was just as charismatic and skilled at just, you know, he'd sat with people, uh, witnesses. And um, they had a wonderful sighting, I remember, in that show. I, I can't remember. I think you just Google William Shatner uh, 70s UFO documentary. It would come right up. But um, I remember he interviewed someone from the Hudson River Valley. And it was really touching and remarkable and thoughtful. And and the guy had a ton of charisma. Yeah, I've always liked Shatner. Yeah, he's he's a very he's a very smart performer. He knows exactly what he needs to do in any given gig, and mm-hmm. um and and he he does it. He's a he's a, a complete pro with that stuff. I uh, I can almost forgive him for Tech War, uh, <laughs> but uh, I I actually read Tech War the first just one just the first one, and um, I know that that he didn't do most of the writing but um it, it, it's it's still um it's it, it's 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 not good but um but hey everybody's everybody's allowed um wasn't there a tv series too yes yes that he was in um and uh is he in in all his Shatnerian glory uh doing his thing and and chewing the scenery where appropriate and uh and the, the show was uh i think oh gosh it was a little better than the book it was sort of a yeah there was a show but there was like a, a tv movie that yeah, uh, yeah. sort of kicked it off um and and then it sort of it sort of went on from there but uh it, it might be the most 90s thing imaginable <laughs> um so uh, TV is one of the things in, in 2019 where you're seeing more and more paranormal and UFO shows. Uh, it's becoming way more of a thing 
than it ever has before, I think. Uh, ghost hunting has been big for a while, and then, then it's Bigfoot. Now it seems to be the UFO thing. And part of that is uh, the whole To the Stars thing doing there. What's the name of theirs? Oh, um. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to, to the Stars. Oh, they're. Oh, they're the, TV show. Um. Oh, gosh. Uh, oh, the, the, with, the, with oh, Leo. Oh, oh Leo this is Zappel. telling. This is telling, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I've only watched one episode, and it was. It just kind of struck me as it's exactly the kind of reports that I'm not interested in at all. And I, I, I watched the very first uh, uh, episode. Unidentified. Yeah. Someone. Good. Someone yeah. had a had a device hooked up to a worldwide web of information to get that answer right. Yeah, I, I threw that. In, I, I threw that on my Google machine there, and okay. uh, yes. And, and and the thing is, and that's why we didn't remember it. It's the most obvious sort of beige name for a show about <laughs> ufos you can possibly imagine um inside america yeah, unidentified inside america's ufo investigation um yeah i i guess i don't know um i i didn't watch any of it i um i i think i mean and and this is this is just me that this is not a a sort of value judgment on the whole thing i know people have varying opinions i don't really care about lights in the sky and objects i i, I don't i'm not excited about it no uh, i i'm much more excited about oh gosh um people people seeing weird things and experiencing weird things that don't act like typical ufo encounters yes. I, I, as yeah. a as a ufo consumer that's um that's what gets me i I mean as a ufo consumer um and sort of a paranormal from the consumer end of it um i found uh i I find stuff like like hellier and seth breedlove stuff to be much more entertaining than 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 sort of the the sort of here's another rehash of this sighting from a file sort of thing I'm, i'm not a big fan of hellier for various reasons, but I think it's exceptionally well done, and it's way better than anything on mainstream television. Yeah, I, I sort of I, I, I like it. I enjoyed it. I think the second season was a little long. <laughs> I, I, I think they could have they could have condensed, but um, I if not, and and you know I I think it's it's marvelously produced. Yes, and I love the way you don't really know what the deal is with it in some ways it's the the constructed narrative versus this is just a video account of what we did um sort of you know that line they blur that fairly well i mean you you know it's constructed because you're not watching it live right you know there's a plan to the way they put things together and 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 the way things are uncovered but it does it in such a way that that I, I was able to to genuinely put that aspect of it out of my mind as I watched, mm-hmm. and it got Alan Greenfield more attention than Alan Greenfield <laughs> probably has ever had, um, which is always a good thing because his stuff is 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 fun and and goofy and weird in all the best ways. Agreed, agreed. That, that's the secret cipher of the UFO Uf- guy. UFO yeah. Oh, I like that um, guy too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, I, I, I guess the sec the the first season there there were things I liked, things I didn't like. Second season, I just feel I just feel like they're forcing synchronicities into place to try and push what they're doing further. And I and I think they're very genuine about it. It just kind of rubs me the wrong way. Like I feel like it's a whole lot of a whole lot of of stuff about nothing. It it and I think if they would have if they would have somehow done it in five episodes instead of ten, I I think they could have. Yeah, I, I just wanted to you know we we here at here at uh, at Chizo Media headquarters as as we uh, we watched as me and my staff watched it, um, we we just kept I mean we started calling everything synchronicities around the house just as a joke you know just right, because right. it's it's just it, it got you just wanted to say okay guys settle down just settle down <laughs> I, I appreciate the 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 earnestness of what you're doing but you know we get it. We get that there's these synchronicities, and it, it's it's just you know, and and honestly, I mean, from my point of view, that's a, a bit of a nitpick. And I think one of the things um, that I had to sort of remind myself as I was watching it is that the things that they're talking about, the things that they're um, 
that they're explaining to people and some of the, the sources they use and people they talk about, it might be stuff that I heard about 15, 20 years ago. Right. I'm not normal. You know, I, it, <laughs> exactly. it's, you know, I, um, I was like, well, yeah, Rebirth of Pan. And then I was thinking, oh my gosh, who knows about Rebirth of Pan? This is actually, I have, a, I have a friend and she, she got really into it and she's like, have you ever heard of this stuff? And I'm like, yeah, but I'm old. So, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I think I read Secret Cypher, the Euphonauts, I think I was in college when it came out and I think I somehow got a copy of it, you know, pretty soon after it came out for some reason and because the, the title just sounded cool and um you know so but but most people you know it, it, you can I'm, i've seen criticisms of well they're just sort of rehashing this or rehashing that and it's like yeah but it's never really been hashed in this way right not not so, to a bigger audience right so i i think i think they've they've really got that going for them i, I really sort of admire their uh I, I sound so old saying this i admire these kids moxie <laughs> in um in in sort of in putting this stuff out there and and putting themselves out there on uh on on, on social media it's, it's it's very much a a social media driven uh driven thing and um they uh they engage with their audience to um maybe an alarming degree i i think that might be another sort of generational gap thing for me but i was like you, you don't need to respond to every tweet you know, it, it's, you know, keep, you know, keep a little mystery, uh, to, uh, to your, your persona. But, um, I, I, I love what I, I love the way they, they did it. And, uh, while there's things that, that maybe if I were in charge, I would change, um, I'm not in charge and, right. uh, it's, it's out there for, for free viewing and, um, which is awesome. Uh, yes. I, the fact that they have, high def downloads of the mm. video files is just i mean it's mind blowing i i you know it's it's not the way media tends to work and i really really appreciate that they are conscious of the fact that that one of their goals is to just get this stuff out there and um and and to sort of involve the audience in speculating about what might be happening and to explore these things and um it's it's such a numinous topic that you're you're not gonna you're not gonna get any sort of any sort of resolution and uh, and my favorite and, and um, one of the people sort of from I think they made a T-shirt of it uh, of an Amazon review one star headline no goblins so you know you, <laughs> it was just like that's perfect and, and that's and to make a T-shirt of that is the perfect reaction because yeah. this is oh, yeah. it's it's very much sort of post paranormal media paranormal media in a way um I, uh, almost um, like the first of a wave of something yeah no no and and that's really good i, I like that they're doing that and they're earnest about it i think with the second season the, the spot where i stopped i think it was at the end of the second episode is they they basically said something like well we proved that um uh oh yeah now i'm forgetting his name the guy who came down and talked to Darren Berger. Um, oh, uh, Indrid Indr Indr Cold, yeah. Yeah, they said something like, well, we proved Indrid Cold existed. And I was like, what? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, it, I that, think that, that, that was the point where I said, I need a break from this. I'm going to come back to it. <laughs> yeah, I. Um, that was... Um, that was odd, um, and the uh, and I loved the uh, the connection with uh, with Tanya uh, Darrenberger, um, Woody's daughter, who has written some very strange sort of stories about her life growing up with Indrid Cold showing up every few months. Um, you know, the, the fact that they went and talked to her. I mean, oh, oh, the film in on this. Uh, this is the first time. They, this. Yeah, they uh, they go down because because Tanya yeah. Darrenberger um, on Facebook. Uh, la a, a year ago, or a year and a half ago, or so, just just sort of posted out of nowhere that uh, I've I've had I've had a visitor. I've been informed that uh, that like Indrid Cold, Carl Ardo, and one of the other people from Lanulos that they're they're all dead. They died in like a saucer crash or something. Yeah. And she'll have more details later. And and then you know you get you know no details. Um, you, you have to buy her new book, I guess. Um, and I will when it comes out, but because I'm, <laughs> I'm a sucker for this sort of stuff. But um, and, and so they they go down to, uh, to to West Virginia to to visit her, and 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 she doesn't really tell them much that she didn't say in her Facebook post. But um, 
I uh, I appreciated that they that they took that step uh, in uh, in in talking to her because she's she she's an, an interesting person. I guess that proves Indrid Cold is real without question. <laughs> um, so later in the series, and this this kind of connects into the whole UFO thing. Uh, someone had asked me what I thought about them hypnotically regressing or hypnotically inducing a ufo abduction i haven't oh. i haven't seen this yet i've heard a number of people comment about it and to me it sounds like a really bad idea it uh it it, it bugged me a little bit um for one reason i wasn't entirely sure how well it fit into the overall story mm. it, it sort of seemed like oh plus we have this cool thing we did with a hypnotist and so here it is but the uh the press kit uh they sent me a press kit which i i greatly appreciate it was a it's a usb drive that is packet it's one of those usb drives that looks like an old cassette tape and mm. um it's got the cassette box and everything in it and part of the press kit is a self-hypnosis version of that experiment that you can do on yourself and uh my wife has informed me in no uncertain terms that i'm not to try to hypnotize myself into thinking <laughs> i was abducted and probably a good thing because otherwise i would be like yeah i'm gonna try this and then i'll probably get freaked out but yeah they um they, they did this and uh it, it's it's worth checking out just to just and if it all went down the way it was presented it, it seems like they they had a fellow who wasn't really a big ufo guy and after this hypnosis session, he, he gradually came to be a UFO believer and to believe that he had been abducted and to, to be a little freaked out by it. And um, it, it just, call me a stick in the mud, it, it strikes me as a, a bit dumb. Um, or now, was this was this like unwise. played to be real or was this like theatrically scripted? No, or? this was this was played to be real. This was presented as as real as as the other things that they're uh that they're doing um so yeah it's uh it's it's very strange I, i've only seen it once I, I should probably watch it again to make sure i'm not misrepresenting it but it uh it, it, it just struck me as as uh as unwise uh, of course building altars to pan also strikes me as unwise to varying degrees but um but I'm not very adventurous, so. But but uh, you're also not messing around with someone's head in that in that right, case. Right. Ex exact. Well, as far as you know, um, <laughs> so uh, Pan might mess you up. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, it, it it just struck me as as especially with what we know about about hypnosis, and I, I just you know think about some of the the hypnosis controversies in the UFO field over the last uh, ten years or so, and and I just I just think this this seems unwise. Now was this well, something I'll, that they let me interject here. I we, this doesn't this is not part of news in it, but I in the in 2017 2018 I did I I you know pulled the pin out of the grenade and did a series of hypnosis sessions about my own experiences, but um and I will tell you this, I am more confused now. Like I have a really good story to tell, but I have I'm like so cautious. Like I have not gone down the road of of like believing it let me put it that way like i got presented that, with an amazing story but that that's good because i mean it's it's been shown again and again the hypnosis doesn't recover memory yeah yeah it it may open up avenues to ways of thinking about experiences mm -hmm. but as far as like being like a record you know it's not it's not for that as, as opposed to to what we were told you know for years from you know the usual crowd that well you know i went to this hypnotist and now i know all the details of how they put the probe in me and, and right, things like right. that and it's, and that's, and that's, it's that's, not, that's i it's recognize like that. that and i there's yeah. a there's like two sides to this thing and i've i've you know i'm like swimming in both those waters at this point you know so i recognize the debate on both sides and i'm like and i that's part of the reason i i did it was just like well now i gotta find out like now i gotta see like how you know what i'm what What's what? You know, what the, what's what with the challenges of trying to make sense of this. And, right. and and I feel I did, I was, like, I am very, I was very cautious not to take it hook, line, and sinker. But, you know, metaphorically, it was, it was a wild story. Really incredible. The, uh, have, have you talked about that story anywhere? 
Oh yes, it's in. It's okay. on my blog. It's in my new book, okay. and and I've I've talked about it endlessly. And I've uh, I'm hosting a podcast series now, and it seems to come up more often than it should. Like it seems like, well, let me just tell the story. <laughs> and um, it's kind of a long story to tell. So okay, all right. Um, the the thing with hypnosis too is that it is an altered state of consciousness. So you may be having a very real experience while under hypnosis. It's just that it may not be the experience you think it is. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah, you're you're being presented with stuff. And I mean, I I have talked to many people who have had hypnosis. And, you know, at the end, they say, you know, I, this story came up and ah, I don't buy it. I don't believe it. And I really respect that. And I've talked to a lot of people who just say, now I know what happened. Now I know what happened on that night of missing time. I know. And both of those are, you know, that's two ends of the continuum. And where the happy medium is, I don't know. I, I don't think that I don't I'm I do not think that hypnosis should be scrapped from from the the tool of of uh you know the toolbox of how to how to dig into this absolutely mm. elusive mystery i think it should be used very cautiously though i think that's i think that's probably the best attitude to to have to it it, it can reveal things but it it often open it can open up more questions you know than <laughs> than, than answers and if you're if you're prepared for that then and, and you're willing to accept that, then it can it can be a I don't I don't know how to say it, it can be a, a, a therapeutic tool of oh, sorts. I, and I've had I've had yeah. I've had a profound therapy session with hypnosis for issues of clinical depression. I think we talked about this in the show. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, yeah. and it was great. It was, I mean, it was remarkable. It was absolutely well, gut wrenching in the moment. And afterwards, I remember literally sitting up in the chair, thinking like, "I am cured. I'm not going to knock wood right now." And <laughs> depression free for six years now and i have not been able to say that since i was 12 years old and that came from a two and a half hour three hour session where i lied on my back and and a hypnotherapist walked me through a past life which i again i have no proof that that past life ever happened but i was presented with a wild story that had with which which i don't care whether it's true or not i reaped the benefit mm -hmm, of the mm -hmm. of the session and and that attitude is perfectly fine to take. It's when people take this stuff to heart and they they insist, oh, this must be what happened. You know, this guy that they hypnotized in Hellier now believes he was abduct abducted by aliens. But we, you know, for all intents and purposes, we pretty sure he's not. You know, they they created that experience whole cloth with the hypnosis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, it's a mess. It's a mess. So. But yeah, I mean, I, you you have mentioned that before, Mike. That's that you you know sometimes the past life regressions can help us. But it might it might be that maybe they, maybe they are past lives, but also maybe they're they're presenting these problems to us in a different way, so that we can make sense of them and deal with them. That's they're presenting them symbolically. Sure, yeah. that's that's like a, it's like um, it's a myth. You know, that's a it's, yeah. a, it's yeah. a story told in symbolic. Yep. You know, framework. Told totally with symbolism, and that's I'm 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 giving you my opinion as far as how you mm -hmm. know that's how I've framed it for myself, and um, but uh, yeah, if we, well, I, let's we should change because I could just get I will get stuck on this if I because <laughs> yeah, either right. you know, either you need an hour for me to tell the story or we don't or, or we should change the subject. So. Well, it's so, more interesting than anything that happened in 2019. So <laughs> well, except it happened in 2018. Yeah. So, uh, okay. yeah. So, uh, well, one of the, the the questions I got from Patreons was, how how about the impact and implications of Diana Pasulka's American Cosmic? Let's talk about that. Yeah. Have you interviewed her, correct? I have not. Oh, you should. Oh, you definitely should. She's, she'd be up. She, you'd be a perfect person to interview her. Okay. I will say um, uh, she spoke about this on Whitley Strieber's show, and I have had many – I've not met her, but I've had many long conversations on the phone with her, and she's given me a little bit of inside – baseball <laughs> like her like basically her book was vetted revetted and revetted again and a remarkable book came out and i kind of have the inside scoop of a few things that um which it's not that interesting but um a few things that that like she wasn't allowed to put in the book i was i was gonna bring up a, about about that um the I, I like the book i'm actually in the process of uh 
of reading it again to review for uh, Nova Religio, which is a academic journal of new and emerging religions. Uh, so I'm, I'm rereading it. And one thing, uh, going back and sort of reviewing all this stuff, is the timeline of when the book was originally sort of expected to come out, and then when the book actually come out. The, the, the thing that kept running through my head was... At some point in the sort of academic press peer review editorial process, something happened. Um, and then on Facebook a, a few weeks ago, she mentioned something about just sort of vaguely about about edits that were made to the book and things that she had to change and, and sort of bypassing the, the sort of established academic press next time around or something like that. And, and so I, I always sort of had the impression that that the book that came out was not necessarily the book that was originally intended to come out, if that makes sense. Well, there was a, so then she talks about it right in the book where um, uh, her research partner, which is very, well, that's just, yes, her research partner. No, this is the fellow who's named Tyler, who's the mysterious Tyler. That's not her research partner. Her research partner, I think is James. Am I getting that right? Yeah, isn't he really the guy who did the Atacama body thing? I am going to remain heard. silent on, on okay. who it may I've, or may not be. I've so. heard it might be him. <laughs> and there's lots of stuff on the internet on who both of these characters might be. But um, so the, the book ends, the, the book was totally written and completed, and then she went to the Vatican. And i got to remember this now. She was researching levitation, I think, uh, that was in uh, ancient documents, ancient Catholic documents that were, you know, that were for the time thoroughly vetted and reviewed and written, you know, for the purpose of of trying to come, you know, to come to some clarity and some truth. So, um, and these were all in a uh, form of Latin that she, that uh, Diana could speak and translate. And so she went and dug through all these old things about levitation. I think I have this right. And um, the mysterious Tyler went along with her to, um, to the, to the Vatican. And he was so moved by, I believe they were following some priests around who were giving the last rites. And he was so moved that he converted to Catholicism. So, so, and then she realized this has to be in the book and there's all kinds of like sort of secret stuff that's hinted at there as far as, you know, him getting into the Vatican because he were, technically wasn't, you have to, there's a, there's a very strict list of things you have to be checked off on. One of them, you have to be a doctor in order to get into the, you have to have a doctorate in order to get into the Vatican library and mm. have published more than one book and peer, you know, so it's like no joke, like you, like, like in Diana, like all the little things were ticked off on the checklist and this other guy didn't have any of them and he magically got in and there's a little bit of mystery there and they hint at it in the book um how he how he managed to get in so uh into the vatican library now um what was also this is i've i've, I've actually someday i want to ask her this they so this character tyler did not drink did not drink coffee did not drink alcohol he goes to rome drinks wine and has espresso and then becomes a Catholic. I would argue that he was on some sort of like euphoric high that can only come from like the first time you're <laughs> you're uh, you have that first like not when I'm not talking about Starbucks in the shopping mall. I'm talking about like on the streets of Rome. You're having you're having a double latte. This is this is this is epiphany stuff. So, um, but anyway, yes. Yeah, so that book, I think I see that book as absolutely groundbreaking. Yeah, it's um, it, it's it's interesting. It's it's a good book. I enjoyed uh, I enjoyed reading it, and um, I I I don't know the degree. I mean, a lot of the talk the 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 the, the talk in the conversation that I, that I'm sort of like, eh, maybe maybe not about is is sort of the the idea that this is some sort of seminal watershed moment in in quotes capital A academia being open to the UFO field, um, and I, I'm. I don't know. Um, it's uh, th there's there's a few people like uh, like um, like uh, Pasolka and uh, and uh, Kripal who are you know established names in in the field of religious studies who are examining this as you know 
within the context of uh, of religious studies. I do think American Cosmic sort of veers outside the um, the type of uh, sort of scholarly detachment. You see, and, and so does Kripal stuff sometimes, uh, to be honest. Uh, outside of the scholarly detachment, you usually see in more um, in the more traditional. Um, religious studies, and thank uh, God for that, because I think the more traditional religious studies would probably dry as old toast. As far as yeah, but if we're looking at the idea of wider academia latching onto this, you know, you've got to, to a degree, color inside the lines. So, so the degree to which books like these represent a watershed moment in academic acceptance of, um, of a. Uh, uh, of the field, or if it's, and there's nothing wrong with this, an academic exploring this in a way that appeals mostly to UFO types who are into it already, you know, it's, you know, where is it on that spectrum? And that's, um, it's, um, it's, it's, I liked the book. I thought it was a, I thought it was a great book. And uh, I, I just, I'm, I, I'm always skeptical of, of you know, this is the moment where we're finally going to get recognition from these people we think need to recognize us. And uh, usually that's doomed to some kind of disappointment. <laughs> well, well, she, so Diana, in her in the book, she argues that, well, she doesn't argue, I mean, she basically says she attended conferences, talked with scientists, and there is an invisible college not of scientists who are open to these ideas, and and uh, of scientists who have had the direct contact experience. Boy, she parses her words so carefully, and she goes right up to the line in many points, but doesn't quite say that. And and I think that was edited out. Um, so, but the there are scientists in the biz who are have had UFO contact experiences who are making great strides in cutting edge science. That is what she's arguing in, in one section of the book. Right. Yeah. So, and, so, and, so, I have, and I have talked to her personally. I don't want to say she, I, don't, I can't speak for her, but she parsed her words very carefully and and the implication in her writing, you don't have to read, you don't have to squint your eyes to read between the lines, is that this is this is unusually common at a certain level of the sciences. So, so what she's suggesting is that people are having these experiences and they're, they are actually helping them in their said fields. Absolutely. Yeah, she states that pretty clearly in the book. And That's then, not surprising. No, and then Whitley Strieber is also covering this too. The Ed Bell Bruno, who I... I hear I can I uh, Ed Bell Bruno is a scientist who uh, devised a way to get from the orbit of the Earth to the orbit of the Moon and other planets too uh, without using rocket fuel. Basically, just giving the little uh, satellite a push and pushing it in a certain direction, which is not at the Moon. It just it, it takes instead of a, a week to get to the Moon or two weeks to get to the Moon, which you can do in rocket fuel. Uh, it takes uh, without any fuel, which is very expensive, to get into space because it's heavy. Mm -hmm. You just push it off in a direction. It makes this giant elliptical orbit way through the, our solar system, and then comes back to the moon. And um, and he, Ed Bell Bruno, and there's a wonderful interview on Whitley Strieber's site from 2009, and also recently, um, where he where he talks about that. And the and he argues that this this scientific epiphany um, was directly influenced by a, a contact experience. And, and that kind of uh, lends credence to my thought that these, these experiences, whereas, whereas they may not be aliens, they are very similar to uh, what a shaman would go through. And that what, you know, these, these experiences are awakening us to other realities and other ways of thinking that uh, we're normally cut off from. And I and I think she says it in the book in and I don't want to paraphrase from memory, but um, she basically says that like nobody believes like in the sciences this this invisible college of people who have had the direct contact experience, um, that they none of them buy the the aliens yeah yeah and then um 
Yeah, like I basically said, like you know, okay, there's you know oodles of people you interviewed in this book, and that that they're featured in the book, and you kind of hint things and hint things. And I I said to her, you know, how many are abductees? How many of these people are UFO abductees? And 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 what does abductee mean? Well, the people who would fall into the classification of having UFO contact. Yeah. So, but her reply, and I'm going to parse this very cautiously, was. Almost all of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think I think we use the wrong language with some of this stuff. Absolutely, we're we're burdened with language, so, so it's our only choice is to use language to describe this stuff. But well, it's but we're but all. When we, but when we say UFO abductees, when we what might really be happening is entering an altered state of consciousness, and and you've said that before that you don't feel necessarily that you ever left your bed. In some of the events, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so yeah. and that's I mean oh that's right I did say that because I in in a, the sitting bag one and I mm-hmm. said I described mm-hmm. it as a, the seminal thing which I call my contact event or excuse me my confirmation event and I was sleeping outside in uh, in cold weather it was March in southern Utah it was below freezing probably but not much below and I had a big winter sleeping bag but I had a little pair of gloves and if I my hands get cold I've slept out a lot in cold weather I'll put a pair of gloves on I just keep the gloves I don't put them in a pocket I just kind of tuck them in my armpit and I'm wearing a down jacket to sleep so I just kind of tuck them in there and I woke up the next morning and it was like something happened last night but my, but those gloves were just gently tucked into my armpit if anything would have happened those would have been disrupted right. so yeah it's a, it's it's a genuine mystery and it's, and I've I've learned to take two steps back and not get. I, I would go insane if I wanted to try to solve the mystery. All I can do is tell <laughs> tell a bunch of stories. Well, the the so I mean, if we take out the idea of being physically abducted and and also come to terms with the fact that there are altered states of consciousness that are just as real as the normal consensus reality, that changes the the the, the whole playing field of what we're looking at. And I would argue that oftentimes what people will say when they have these experiences, I do not have this experience to speak from uh, personal experience, but people will say the, the, the events interacting with the beings, let's say, are more real than mm-hmm. our, our waking consciousness. I've had one person say that it was like, um, like if you're in a movie theater, right, there's the reality is on the screen. That's all like two-dimensional. But the real reality is like, all in three dimension. They're saying that the what we're experiencing, this waking life, is on the two dimensional screen. When they're in with, when they're dealing with the beings, they are in a richer, more dimensional, stranger, timeless environment. Than, which is, <clears throat> which is exactly what people who have near death experiences describe. It's exactly and, what people who have shamanic uh, journeys describe. Exactly, and Kenneth Ring has shown the connection between near death experiencers and UFO abductees very well in his Heading to, uh, Omega Project book. And that's thirty years old, or yeah. forty years old, maybe. Yeah, for, I don't know. Uh, it's ni- from the mid nineties. Yeah, ninety two. I think it came out roughly. All right, let's jump back to twenty nineteen, though. <laughs> um, this year. So let's see. I had a few other things here. People had suggested. Obviously, uh, you know the the to the stars thing comes up constantly. Uh, one person said, "I'm wondering about Tom DeLonge and some of the news releases over the last year." Uh, he says, or they said, it feels a lot like the kind of disinformation campaigns we lived through in the 1980s and into the 1990s. It sure does. Yeah, yeah. But, but not as fun. Um, <laughs> You know, it, it's, it's funny. You get a rock star, and you can't have you. It's it's not as fun. I agree. Who wants to do you know, comic books? That's what he said when he like st- like started this whole thing. He said, I want to do UFO comic books. Like, where the hell are those? I'm waiting. Seriously, yeah. I give me the UFO comic book. That was those old um those old uh, key comics. They they did like comic books of some like UFO sightings. Sometime. Oh yes, like, yes, and those were great. They, um, I I think my my thing with it it, it there are. I think some disinformation aspects to it, or some at least misdirection sorts of things going along with this. Um, I I think, you know, they're trying to really gin this up into being, I think, more interesting than it might be. Um, Some Navy pilots saw some things, and we've got great footage of things that don't behave, you know, as we would expect an aircraft to behave. Does that mean it's alien i mean they're not they're just saying it's unidentified you know but the implication of course is that 
you know, this is ET stuff. This is disclosure. We're getting, you know, I think one of the big stories that hit was, you know, there's there's the Navy announced new, like, guidelines for reporting these sightings, um, which, I mean, I, I don't want to be a killjoy, but... Oh my goodness! A different form to fill out. You know, this yeah. is this is groundbreaking. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, it's we we know that pilots see unidentified things. We we yeah. know that pilots report these things. Um, th- this is the same sort of cycle of of revealing information that that commonsensically is is not that not that exciting. But you've got some personalities attached to it that that make it an event and they've got this you know the 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 business side of it the the media uh media i'm not sure media empire is the (laughs) the best way i think that's what they're going for yeah and and that's honestly that i mean you can't fault them for coming up with a a new angle to make money on this i it's it's that's fine and i i just there's there's just so much um there's just so much i think there are some people pinning so much hope on this whole thing yeah and i that, am not one of those people no yeah, me I, neither I, mean, it, it's, I it's, if it's, they could get a good comic book out of it that's where i'm <laughs> <talking>. <laughs> that that's a success in our book now, um, now one of the things uh one of my listeners jennifer campbell sent in she sent this in a couple of times and for some reason we never addressed it uh but um yeah, there's this article that The Intercept put out that says the media loves this UFO expert who says he worked for an obscure Pentagon program. Did he? And it talks about uh, <laughs> Luis Elizondo there and how there's actually no evidence he actually worked for this program that he's been you know pushing and talking about and everything. Yeah, that yeah, but was that's a, the Bob Lazar a... thing that, you know, like, did he really go to MIT and stuff like that? So, I mean, this yeah. is yeah. like, this is, I think he just... All you have to do is drip feed this, this, these little doubts into the system, and it, it everything, you know, the, the debunkers can say it all crumbled, and the true believers can say no, it did not. So I don't, yeah. I don't know where to stand on this. It, you know, so it, here in the beginning, when they did that fake press conference, right? Do you remember the, the, <laughs> where they stood in front? Of, like it was obviously they were in a set, and they're like addressing the audience, and there was obviously like whatever, a couple cameramen there, like drinking yeah, coffee yeah. or something, and. And it was pretty razzle dazzle. It was like high end as far as like trying to do this thing. It looked like the Academy Awards or something. And so there's a team of, I can't remember how many t- t- chairs were behind uh, Tom DeLong, maybe six chairs or something. Each one with either they were outright CIA agents or people with in the military with very, very, very high secret clearances. And, and Tom DeLong says, and then there was this guy. And they would only talk with. You know, like he's basically talking about sitting at a table with CIA agents, you know, and and he said, there's this guy and they would only call him L. And that's all. <laughs> and it was just like, oh, my God, the CIA. Agents, oh, they were just whispers name L. And I was and then they introduced me to him. And here he is. And I was like, like, how like like that didn't like they didn't have to spend a hundred billion dollars on a special satellite to like mess with you tom DeLong. all they had to do is like whisper a little bit and say like we can't use his name and you could just see him like if this like you know doe-eyed like innocence like golly i get to meet the guy that the like the ca agents <laughs> like couldn't even say his name in front of me now i know him he's my buddy so um I, like it seemed a little and now he's the star of a tv show and he's yeah. on like every podcast and he's like being interviewed by george knapp and he and I'm certain there, and if there, like, so I like, if there isn't a desk in the Pentagon where they have to deal with this stuff, then there, that's like a total horrible criminal oversight on the yeah, part of I our mean, government. They have to have that. It's a huge liability not to have somebody taking a look at things we're not sure what they are in our well, airspace. I mean, our airspace. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah like, well, like, of course. I'm so, like, I, why should we be like, golly, it's it re- really? I mean, I, 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 it's like, it seems a little, yes, of naive. course they're going to hold their cards yes, to their naive. chest and they're going to play every little magic trick they can to, to, to send us off on wild goose chases. And and the thing that gets me is, um, you know, they, they've got, you know, I think Hal Putoff is is involved with them, and uh, you know, and, and you know, he's got you know a long history of of being involved in, in sort of government paranormally sort of things. But the, the, the thing is, for some reason, 
at at what point? Well, I know what the point is, but there's we we've we've hit a point where you know don't trust anyone. The government's covering this up. The the military industrial complex and and the intelligence people are are you know hiding the truth about aliens. Except for these members of the military industrial complex, <laughs> we can believe every word they say because they're saying what we want to hear. And they're yes. su- and they're sucking up to us, and and suddenly, you know, it's 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 sort of like with with you know, it's it's going back to that academic side of things, the, you know, UFO. I'm I'm going to use the word fans. UFO fans have just this incredible inferiority complex sometimes, and this idea that somebody who might possibly be important is paying attention to us and what we care about. That sort of overrides some some common sense sometimes. I think, and and I, I think like like you said earlier, th- this is not the first time we've seen this kind of stuff. No, and and I I, I would love to see um, a sort of demographic breakdown of I don't know. They'd have to self-report, so it wouldn't be that useful. But sort of a you know age age bracket breakdown of the TTSA fans and mm. I would put money on many of them not being old enough to remember <laughs> the first few times this sort of thing shows yeah. up yeah. you know and and, and not, not because you know they're dumb but just because you know if if your source of UFO knowledge is the internet you're you're going to have a fairly broad but fairly shallow you know, overview, and I you know, sound like an old man, but you know, people don't read books about this stuff like they used to. No, and and so that well, you that's don't, what Twitter's for. Yeah. Well, right. You know, I, I'm following them on Twitter, so I'm getting all the information I need. That's where I get my news um, about everything, not just about this. But um, it's uh, it, it's sort of it's amazing how lightweight some of this TTSA stuff seems. It seems very flashy and superficial and and there's no uh, there's no there there sometimes. And 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 then the, the questions come up about uh about Big Lou's employment and, and was he doing this job and was and like like you said, Mike, both sides can say, well see, this proves that I'm right. You know, the skeptics will say, boom, he didn't work for him. The believers will say, well if he did work for him it would be a secret, and we wouldn't have any documentation. <laughs> yeah, so, which is which is a f- fair argument in a way. I mean, so they if they wanted to sow the seeds of doubt, they could, you know, st- that'd be very easy. That's the easiest thing they could scramble is have someone write an article and 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 quite, you know, maybe he was told, you know, that you can come forward, but. I'm so but here's my sense. He was not he did not break ranks and like <laughs> write this like hissy fit letter to the. Pentagon saying I'm quitting and I'm going to go forward with the UFO story. Like there was like this is yeah. that's theater. Oh, yep, absolutely. I don't have any proof of that. So absolutely. He wants to well, beat me up. He's a big guy, so I got to be careful what I say. So. It's it's, <laughs> it's one of those things where where somebody made the argument that you know if he did have this you know submit this resignation letter, then uh, that should be you know FOIAable. Uh, or if he wrote it to be, you know, placed in the file, or he wrote it, you know, with the intent of sort of unofficially telling people that this was his view, um, you know, which is probably more likely. It, it's it is theater. It it is theater, which is great. Um, but at at the at the end of the day, on all this stuff, and actually on on everything we'll be talking about tonight, there gets to a point where that I'm getting to sometimes where somebody tells me this story or, or they present this narrative. And, and the first thing that pops into my head is it, why should I believe you? You know mm-hmm. why? I mean, I know. So maybe it's completely logical that you cannot provide documentary evidence that what you're saying is true. In that case, I reserve the right to just sort of say, okay, I understand what you're saying. And I, I, you can't prove it, so it, if it can't be proven, it can't be proven. So why should I believe it? You know. I mean, yeah. So now, here, let me just chime in. So I'm writing these books about like far out experiences people have with owls and UFOs and psychic experiences, and and I can't prove any of it. Like I'm just taking testimony. I'm like listening to people's stories. I'm telling stories. I'm retelling their stories. What? So what? All I can do is say, boy, this sounds an awful lot like the other story I heard. 
And I know these people haven't been like, you know, whispering behind right. each other's backs to, to, to mess with me. Here's, so, here's where the, here's where I see the, the sort of difference though. I, I see a, a distinction between, you know, here I am understanding and, and, and listening to people's people telling me what their personal experiences are and I, I, things that, that cannot be proven. That's different than somebody saying there were these public policy decisions made, but I can't prove it. You know, yeah. so yeah. I, I've, I've got a higher level of skepticism for people who say, you know, in a giant bureaucracy where everything is kept track of and, and we should be able to track at least some things. And if there's stuff you can't track because it's so secret, there's no paperwork you can find, then you you wouldn't be saying it out loud. You wouldn't be allowed to say it out loud if mm-hmm. it's really so secret that that nobody can confirm or deny anything. And I think that's I have a different sort of sort of threshold of of tolerance for yes. for personal accounts and personal encounters because because those things you know for all of human history have defied rational explanation um government agencies generally do not operate on that that realm if that yep. makes sense. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So I've I've a lot more time for people's personal encounter stories than I do for I worked this job but I can't prove it. Yeah. <clears throat> and at the same time, yes, and and, and I'm, I'm just so if I was head of this, I mean, so I, I I'm going back to the same thing again. I recognize there's a need to do two things to research ufos if i was in the pentagon holy crap i would want to know if about right. ufos and at the yeah. same time if i was in the pentagon it's like you know let's let's hush hush this let's not like bark at this you know let's not well let's, 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 let's not, not make a comic book about this <laughs> let, let, let's not talk about the things we don't understand because we don't want the general public to realize there's things out there that we can't explain in our own airspace exactly yeah exactly so i would obfuscate it i would create little dead end trails and i would Create the that would create theater. Yep. Yeah, and and one of the things in this article too, uh, it says somehow we are to believe that this is the mindset with which stayed former members of the military and intelligence community sought to join forces. But perhaps there's a more innocent answer. To the stars, which raised more than two million dollars from investors, was originally hyped as a UFO research company that would explore the outer edges of science. But its Security and Exchange Commission filing identifies it as a motion picture and videotape production concern. <laughs> but not a comic book concern. So No, no comic books. But the point is, it, it's literally filed as entertainment. And yep. I think that there's like, Tom DeLonge's got a little office in LA, and it ain't a big office. And I've talked to people who've been there, and it's like, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's, you know, he's he seems like an earnest guy, and he's like trying to make things happen. He's put out a handful of books. and But yeah, there's this like, you know, what's the big machine? So when, when, uh, uh, Stanton Friedman, when the article came out in the New York Times, he basically said, like, somewhere a switch got thrown. I would have loved to have been in the room when that decision was made to how to throw that switch. Like, I would love to be in the room and, like, hear, like, okay, how are, how are we going to play this? I would love to know all that stuff. And all we can do is guess and speculate at it. And I, and, and I am absolutely certain that they're playing with us. They're playing, mm-hmm. they're toying yep. with us the same way I yep. toy with my cat with a string on the floor. And which is fair, but you know, like I know going into it that, that, that press conference was not in front of an audience and that was staged and scripted and like, who wrote that script? Like, why did they put that stuff in that script? You know, it was, you know, there's, there's, I'm certain that those Navy pilots saw something and it's a pretty sure. good story, but like, I only got so much patience for that before I want to move on to like, like, well, question I would ask to that Navy pilot, like, do you have ESP now? Do you have psychic <laughs> yeah, experiences? Yeah. yeah. Have you had any other experiences? Yeah, how'd your since life then? yeah, exactly. How'd your life change? Do you have any other experiences? You know, exactly. And, uh, whoever asked about that also mentioned the project blue book, which did, I don't think we talked about it on the show. I think we talked about it beforehand. Um, I, I really like the project blue book series. Um, 
Aaron, you somehow haven't seen it. I, I, well, not some. I, I have not seen it um, because I am, I am televisually lazy, uh, and, and I am and, televisually and default. Like, I, I, to I get it. I went comfort viewing of things I've already seen a billion times uh, most <laughs> of the time. But I, I've on principle. I've got no objection to it, and uh, and and I, I do intend to check it out sometime um, this year. <laughs> uh, uh, no, really, I, I will. They just, um, they just started the second season, and I, what I like about it is it is fictionalized. Because as uh, one of you said, it would be really boring if it wasn't. Um, but it's, so it's a fictionalized show. But at the end of each show, they tell you what the actual case was. Oh, that's cool. I like that. And and so it's telling you this was based on this. You can go look up more information on it. And I'm like, okay, that actually really redeems the fact that it's fictional because it, it's giving you the source material. Um, but the other thing is, and the minor spoiler, um, for season two, they're, they're looking at, uh, they start wondering how many of these UFO sightings are actually military craft that we just don't know about yet. Ah, yeah, and and there's a guy, the fellow who plays the general, General Harding. I can't remember what his name is. The the square jawed guy with the gray hair, and he's mm-hmm. kind of. Uh, he was he he was in um, Minority Report with he was uh, Tom Cruise's partner in Minority Report. Oh, okay. And yeah. um, I can't remember the actor's name. He's great. He's like totally. He's perfect. He's cast him perfectly. But I can't. You know, he like three times every show. He kind of like bangs the table and says, "We need to control the narrative." And I'm like, yes, that's yeah. like a, that's like a, that's a, that's a pop culture term from right now, you know, control the narrative. And they're, so that's, mm-hmm. they're, they're cherry picking that line from, from, you know, Richard Dolan or something like that. This is, that's modern stuff, I feel. And uh, so, yeah, so there's, there's how to say, we talked about this a little bit before the show and I sense that the decision-making process around the conference table and how they were going to do this show basically came down to saying, let's do a show exactly like the X-Files. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It has the same feel, the same ambiguity, the same sort of, you know, uh, dichotomy between the two main actors. Exactly. Yeah. And it's got, it's also got, um, well, it does, it does have cooler cars. I'll tell you that than the X-Files. You know. Hey, Ford Tauruses are great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from the, Detroit. So the occasional, well. the occasional Buick century, you know, I, there's something about X-Files rental cars that I, I just, they're I, easier I, to swallow than the cars just a few years before. They They're are. Just about just when they put them through the wind tunnel and they turned into that, like, you know, <laughs> that caplet shape as opposed to the, uh, yeah. the dry, chalky aspirin shape. <laughs> so, uh, one of the other stories uh, from 2019 that someone uh, pointed out was, uh, and this was actually on NPR because I just looked it up October 8th, 2019, not one drop of blood, cattle mysteriously mutilated in Oregon. Yeah, that um, that was fun. Uh, it, it's it's um, not for not for the cattle. Well, the cattle, the cattle know what they're getting into, um, <laughs> and <laughs> they got it coming. Um, one more cow I can't eat, uh, but um, yeah, it's it's interesting because you know, I, like you said, it, it shows up on on. I think I heard it on All Things Considered. Yeah, that's something. what it's on. Yeah, and, and there's um, only been ten thousand reports like stretching back to the 60s and why did they pick that one that day that month that you know yeah and um they you know and and they played up the the alien angle which is you know sort of the the go-to cattle mutilation thing going all the way back to the uh uh you know leo sprinkles um you know there was uh, was it who was the uh, was it myra hansen was the abductee who saw the uh the cow Oh, floating uh, on, in a vat on, of gray matter in, or something in in the U- during her abduction experience, yeah. And so then you sort of get this connection. That's where that that sort of mutilation UFO connection comes from. But then, then you have it's you proven. know other they proved it. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I, I, Mike. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but uh, but you know, then you got, have got have got other researchers who posit other paranormal um, things and and other you know terrestrial things that might uh, that might be responsible but uh, but it's and you know it's got uh, you know they, they sort of they sort of x-filed up the story I think you know it's like you know authorities can neither confirm nor deny you know blah 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 so it was it was uh, it was good it was a nice little blast from the past but like you said there, there's been you know thousands and thousands of these uh, so but they also they also didn't dismiss it 
No, it was um, they, they didn't say, oh, clearly this was, you know, a coyote or, yeah, yeah. or something. So that was, um, you know, they, they did a good job of, of describing the usual, you know, I think I think they, they mentioned that the blood, no blood right. uh, you know, at the scene and everything. So it was it was good. And it sort of goes back to the point we were making at the uh, at the beginning that uh, to, to to some degree, times have changed uh, about the way some of these things are reported. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Now, one of the other th- stories that has popped up is the Colorado drone mystery, where we've had all these uh, these drones that nobody seems drone swarms, I guess they're being called, um, that no one knows what they are, or who ha- who's flying them. Uh, the FAA has claimed ignorance, uh, but the answer could be a secretive Air Force program intended to keep prying eyes away from nuclear missile silos. So this is one of those. Oh, we don't know what it is. This is really mysterious. Yeah, it's the government. Yeah, that. Yeah, well, I mean, and- drones are drones are. I mean, you can go to the hardware store or the toy store and buy one for forty nine dollars. It's pretty darn remarkable, you know. So, oh yeah, uh, yeah So yeah. this is. I mean, like, yes, it's 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 terrestrial. Let me put it that way. But apparently, they were seeing. They said uh, there's been as many as 16 drones that had been spotted in Phillips and Yuma counties. The locations of the drones alone was enough to prompt suspicion. The two counties combined have just over 14,000 residents, which aren't known for having a large contingent of drone enthusiasts. Oh, so yeah, so yeah, it was sort of very out of place. Yeah, um, yeah. That's. Uh, it, I mean, it, it it's interesting. I, I think using a swarm of drones to uh, to sort of patrol things and, and that makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, but but it, it it is. It's it's sort of it's it's sort of a time when you know we're we're used to seeing more things in the air and sometimes I think that that sometimes we we suspect there might be more drones around than there are just because of the press. Whenever you know, like when Amazon talks about drone delivery of things i think there's a little bit of drone panic sometimes um mm. which i think rightfully so i'm not sure we know exactly how to regulate airspace sometimes in a way that won't lead True. to my amazon stuff getting hit by a helicopter or something or the teenager and, like you know like trying to make his own like you know funny little video by putting his his cell phone on the drone and getting yeah. you know footage from that can be quite remarkable you know yeah, yeah. those things are capable of being incredibly steady on a calm day you know if i was still uh, if i was still young and, and and dumb and living out in the middle of nowhere and i had a shotgun with me and i saw a drone i would really try to take that thing out just for fun um but uh <laughs> and um i was actually i was talking to a uh a, a colleague who was who was walking down the street um in in town here and and somebody was messing around with the drone in town and you know, he he was sort of he couldn't see where the person controlling it was, but the drone he just sort of hovered right in front of his face and really pissed my friend off. It's like just get your drone out of here. I'm walking down the sidewalk, and you've got some dope with a drone. Uh, right. So it, it's it's going to be one of those things that 20 years ago we never would have thought would be a an issue we would have to deal with, and and that it would get inevitably mixed up with with everything else that those of us who pay attention to weird stuff in the skies <laughs> have to uh, have to think about and rule out. And, and, and this is why lights in the sky aren't very interesting. Exactly. Because exactly. they certainly could be, you know, drones. Yeah, exactly. And I, in my second book, I did a whole chapter on a woman. Her name is Cindy Bailey Dove. And uh, she had both UFO experiences and then seemingly under highly synchronistic circumstances ended up living very very close to a small airport that i mean it could be it could be written off as paranoia it could be it could be seen as literal truth you know like exactly as she's saying it that that was doing some sort of drone research so there's this there's this blurring in that story of between drones and ufos and and i can't untangle the knot but um but I have talked for hours and hours with Cindy, and she's a wonderful person, and she, I feel strongly, has, and I document some of her her uh, real UFO experiences. So here's someone with real UFO experiences being plagued with drone sightings. And she's straight up clear that these, no, these are man-made drones. So mm-hmm. what's, mm-hmm. what's happening there? There's mm-hmm. this crossover between 
you know, this the UFO contact experience and these other elusive mysteries like scientists and and psychics and channels and shamans and there's this it's a it's a weird part of this lore that is underexplored. Certainly by Luis Elizondo. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> There, I'm got my I got on my high horse there for a little bit. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean it's it's so hard with the technology we have. You know, people will send me videos. Oh, look at this video, and it's like a little dot. You know, well, not only that. Sometimes it, sometimes they look too good. But how do you justify it at this point? Because it's so easy to make a fake video, yep. and if we can make this stuff, imagine what the people who are working with uh, you know top secret technologies can do, whether they be governmental or corporate. You know. Absolutely, yeah. So the, the, it's hard to trust anything modern as far as sightings reports or videos or anything because any of it can be faked. Who knows what technology is out there? It's just there's so many unknowns, and there's such a, a difference between what we do know and what potentially other, you know, like I said, corporate entities or governments have that they're not telling us about. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's it's, it's, a, um, it's a minefield. It's yeah, visual visual evidence from you know anywhere the internet anywhere that that may look great may look like you said may look too great. What does it tell us? It tells us tells us nothing. Um, yeah. It's but you know uh, back before we had all this technology back when it was difficult to uh more difficult to uh, to to fake things like this what did all of those photos from the 50s and 60s tell us you know <laughs> not a lot either you know so yeah, yeah. um and and you know you got you know great photos like you know McMinnville and and things like that but you know the you end up debating the photo and and not really getting anywhere so yeah it's um it's and it's it's the 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 water's even even muddier now so so is 2020 the year of disclosure <sighs> absolutely <laughs> right on <laughs> I, I mean straight, baby let's, i mean let's come on as, as soon as we figure out who the disclosure candidate is you know <laughs> there we go would, they will you know appear obviously be blocked by the cabal from winning and but not um, from talking on jimmy kimmel yeah. right they, right they can always go on there they can they can be a board member of ttsa and um we'll we'll, we'll get the truth now now there's there's a 2019 thing that we didn't mention but oh, i think that? it was crucial storm area 51 Oh my oh, god! Yes, yes, very important. Yeah, it was um, it, it's, a new it's, festival. The, the, my favorite thing about Storm Area Fifty One is that so far it's the only time I've been on um, a, a national NPR program. You, uh, you really? did it. You yes. broke the, You got the, got a blog post. You know, you went the. You took the big step. Yeah, it was a uh, um, uh, the uh, show. It's been a minute, and uh, sort of a weekly news wrap up uh, discussion thing. And uh, they talked to me for. 20 minutes and i uh i was stuck in a hotel in fort lauderdale at a conference and um it was it was after i was supposed to check out so i had to like beg for extra time to be in the room to get on <laughs> skype so I was, I was terrified but uh and they they edited it down to like five very very good minutes about it and um i'm not i'm not sure if my prediction about it made it on there but i predicted that it will sort of collapse into some sort of marketing opportunity which is exactly oh, yeah. you know what happened um yep. but uh yeah it turned into what, what rival music festival nonsense and i was really um i, I think uh adam go rightly and i sort of were trying to get uh, area 51 fire fest trending as a as a hashtag on twitter we were really <laughs> waiting for the fire fest style fraud and uh you know disaster and collapse to uh to take over but uh, it all ended up being much more boring than that now did yeah. anything actually happen no no okay there, nobody went there on the appointed day uh like five, what a hand five, five yeah, people five people something like that okay yeah that's five more than maybe should have yeah so um, but, but they did they didn't get like like one guy got detained because he was drunk or something like that but no one like stormed area 51 like they just went up to the gate you know as close as you can get legally i think yeah and yeah, um, i've been there it's like it's it's like boy it would be like there's no water there right so you get 
how do you, everyone's got to bring their own water. Well, <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like, this, that just was, as a start. That was one of the things that was, you know, these, these two outfits started talking about promoting these music festivals and the local government was just like, what are you people doing? You have no plan for, for sanitation, for water, for food. Um, and this is going to end up costing the locals massive amounts of money to to sort of support the infrastructure for some of this. So it, it turned into a whole – actually, it's a really interesting sort of demonstration of, um, you know, the, uh, the inability of, you know, sort of, sort of how local government would cope with, you know, internet meme stupidity. And, you know, when internet meme stupidity, you know, takes physical form in your county, you know, what do you, what do you do? I mean, ideally, I, I would lock everybody up, but. It's well, how do you lock all these people up? Or do you even lock them up if it, like, it was the, the millions showed up that they were, you know, they were hoping for? It's the desert of Montana. Nobody's going to ask too many questions where you put these people. In Nevada, Nevada, yeah. In Nevada, you know, the, the yeah. good old desert even, burial. Even hotter, yeah. So. Yeah. So the Mont <laughs> knows, how to, knows how to detain people in Nevada pretty well. Yeah. Um, but it, it just, it was, you know, it's just so, it, it was probably the most sort of social media moment Ever, it's just the, the the rapidity with which sort of a dumb joke becomes a thing that people think is real, not getting that it's a joke. Becomes, but it's happening more and more. I know, it's it's uh, it's distressing. Um, yeah, because like Donald Trump would be one example of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, look 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 at the OK symbol used as the white power yep. symbol that someone made up as a joke. And then white power people really started using it, and suddenly the OK symbol is a hate symbol. And it's like, are you serious? Yeah. It, it's like it goes from being, let's make a joke about this being a hate symbol to sort of show how panicky people are about hate symbols to being a hate symbol. Like yeah. you said, it, it's, it's just like memes come to life. And it's uh, you know, it, you, you know, QAnon. You know, it, it, it's yeah. you know, all of this type stuff is, is just... Um, it just comes to life so quickly and has uh, and has real world consequences. And, and, and fortunately, with with Area Fifty One, the the real world consequences did not involve you know injury or death. But right, right, it, I, it, it easily could have. You know, and, and, it, it, and, re- and are, realistically, we're dumb. Yeah, realistically, anything the government has is no longer going to be at Area Fifty One. It's going to be at another no. base we know nothing about. You know, anything they're trying to hide. I mean, and that's, that's you know, we, when we're talking about, like, Luis here, we're talk- look at, you know, Lazar. The thing that always bugged me about Lazar is he signed these NDAs, and he's not allowed to talk about any of this stuff, but then they don't do anything when he goes out and starts talking about it, whereas legally, they wouldn't have to assassinate him. They could have just arrested him. Right. And they didn't. So why didn't they, you know? Oh, well, well then that would have that would have told us all he was telling the truth, you know, mm-hmm. that, that, that's sort of the, the sort of, you know, You're conspiratorial right. way. So it's like if, if they silence him, that means he was he was for real. And if they if they ignore him and say, we don't know who this clown is, that means he's telling <laughs> he's the truth. He's for real. <laughs> yeah, he's for real. And, and if you can't find his transcripts and he's clearly lying about stuff, well, clearly he must have a reason. So. They, they they erased his past, right? Um, <laughs> I, All I, right. I, I long for the purity of just like straight up flying saucer grifts, like mining <laughs> operations that are clearly scams and things like that. All right. So what do you have going on, Aaron? And where can people find you? Um, uh, the saucer life is uh, is still continuing to <laughs> still. Uh, it, it hasn't died yet. Um, Good. Every time I do a, a a really bizarre episode. I'm like, if, if this does the, the Christmas poetry and fan fiction episode, um, people loved it. I'm like, that was the, that was my plan to kill the thing off. Um, but, uh, it, it's still coming out, um, every other Wednesday. Uh, our most recent episode came out, uh, today actually about contactee reinhold schmidt who um who actually had a film made a movie made about his experiences that you can't find but it, it's not oh. available but i i've seen it and so i uh i sort of review it and he also uh, went to prison for um bilking elderly women out of 
in total about thirty thousand dollars, which in nineteen sixty one was real money, um, to uh, to to buy shares of mines where he would mine this mysterious quartz the aliens told him about that would heal crippled children. Oh. Um, he he was he's he's uh, he's saucer scum, I, I think, but but he's uh, it, it's an entertaining uh, entertaining contact detail. So saucerlife dot com, you can check out that and uh, all of the other. Um, all of the other uh, trips into saucer goofiness and and not goofiness. We uh, probably one of the, the more sort of serious, creepy sort of this is grim stuff episodes we did. I um, I looked into um, Martin Cannon's uh, the controllers essay about the uh, the mind control aspects of the abduction phenomenon, and uh, and and that was that was pretty good too. I think um, because because there's he makes a convincing case that some aspects of the abduction experience mirror government mind control experimentation to an alarming degree not all of them mm, uh, yeah, but yeah. there's you know it, it's the abduction phenomenon could be a smoke screen for for other chicanery and mike you can find me at uh my blog which is the the hub i guess which would be hidden experience and if you want to get a hold of me and find that thing, you can just Google my name. Excuse me, you don't, I'll start over. You can just Google UFOs and owls, and I will be the first thing that comes up. And you can find my site easily just by doing that. <laughs> and then um, I have, over 2019, I published a book, which is my memoir in a way. Uh, it's a collection of blog posts from 10 years of blogging from my blog, uh, Hidden Experience. The title of the book is Hidden Experience. And um, I have just completed the audio which should be out very soon i read the entire nice. book it was the most brutal thing i've ever done i was trying to read that and this we were talking about my hypnosis session it's in the book the book's been out since june that same hypnosis session is i is on the blog i wrote about it on the blog so um and you have yeah. a podcast going too and right? now i have a podcast that's right with whitley streber on his site uh unknown country and the the podcast is called the unseen and I have been interviewing mostly people who have had the direct UFO contact experience. Sometimes I'll, I'll be, I've been talking a lot about synchronicity, which has been really great, but um, mostly about the UFO contact experience. And it's been just, you know, it's been wonderful to, to be able to just have a formal way to talk to people for about an hour, an hour and a half about their experiences. It's been just really great. Uh, it's most weeks, I mean, every couple of months I miss a week, but it's once a week on Wednesdays. Oh, you you guys are both Wednesday people, huh? Yeah, the Michigan yeah. thing, Wednesday thing. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, Mike. I just want you to know that that even though I could do it, I will not register the domain name owlsandufos.com. dot com. Um, <laughs> it's available. So, oh, you just looked it up. Yeah. So I was like, oh wow, that would be. Just get that to redirect to my site would be. Um, <laughs> and, oh, and, I'll, and and once again, uh, uh, the the introduction of the book, the foreword. Excuse me, the foreword of the book was read by. A red pill junkie, and I had to, I had to figure out a place in Mexico City. I had to find a, uh, a recording studio in Mexico City, and he did a perfectly professional job. I'm sure he did. It sounds it, great. It sounds good. Uh, it was up on up on Facebook, and um, or he put a link to it on Facebook, and I, I listened to that introduction, and it, it was. I mean, the content was great, but his delivery was was great, and you know, it's, you know. So many of these audiobooks, you, you sort of get used to them being done by professional audiobook readers, and you think, well, you know, you know, other people doing it might not. Be. Nope, nope, perfectly. Oh and, yeah, and, yeah. You know, you know, audiobook quality job there. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And I, there was like, there was no way I was going to have someone else read his words. His voice alone is so beautiful that yeah. it needed to be him. Yep. So. All right, so you, we're going to do a Patreon segment with you two, uh, but this is the end of this episode, and I thank you again for coming on for our yearly um, UFO history series now. Yeah, thank you. And I want to take a moment to give a special shout out to my Patreons, without whom this show may not exist the way it is. And to those of you pledging $10 or more, an extra special thanks, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, Tim, Luke Osborne, Rob Drummond, Alex Whitcomb, Nadine, Damian Talman, Edu Camelhort, Tactical Therapist, Janet Bunderson, 36 Dingo, Maria, Jennifer Campbell, American Rambler, Kevin, 
John Rutledge Foster, Eric Citron, Andy McNamara, Sasha Lyorg, Matthias Sumby, Dominic O'Malley, Christopher Vaughn, Riker and Stark, Sean Cosgrove, Jose A., Roger Gonzalez, Craig Cicernos, Lindsay Jackson K., Alfred Tuttle, Kevin Schreck, Patricia Gaiaquinta, William Lovelace, Mark Brady, Chris is a hot dog a sandwich, and Carla Mahoney. Thank you all so very much. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.